Here in Paradise City of Sun and Fun, we got a chance to go flying in the Outback Shock, as you see here. This is an airplane produced by Zlin in the Czech Republic, and it's being sold in America by Sport Air USA, run by Bill Canino, with whom I flew this morning in this airplane, number 918 Alpha Lima. And the Outback is actually the name the model of this the word shock that you see appearing down here is a series of options now some of the options are these great big landing gear that you see up here with the long extension shock absorbers the big alaska type tundra tires and down here underneath is a shock absorbed also large tired tail wheel that in combination with flaps that double extend down. There is a considerable amount of gap in here. There's also a secondary gap here. These are called double Fowler slotted flaps. And they also have, I don't know if the camera can pick them up here, but there's a whole series of VGs in here to really make this adhere. These flaps come down 48 degrees, Bill indicated, and that's my, my word in flight was that these are barn door flaps, but a barn door flap is just a great big thing that comes down and it's solid and it's connected almost tightly to the wing. Barn door is the wrong word here because of all this air that comes through here and through here, but it gives the aircraft some amazing capabilities. This is a tip plate out here, and that will restrict the amount of air that tends to tumble from the lower side of the wing up to the higher side of the wing, and just makes that wing tip a little bit more effective without having to actually extend it out there. In addition, uh, the tail surfaces were changed somewhat. They were relocated on the airplane. Uh, and there was a number of changes. And all of these things together add up to what Bill calls the shock options on the airplane. In addition, of course, I got to mention the great big engine on the front of this thing. It uses the Continental Titan, the Titan engine now by Continental, 180 horsepower and a four-cylinder engine that just really gives a lot of power to the airplane and gives it some amazing speed capabilities. Not speed in the sense of going fast. This airplane isn't about going fast. It's about being able to handle, literally, outback type conditions, bush conditions, if you will. And it's gonna be a popular airplane with folks like up, up in Canada, uh, up in Alaska, well, Canada too, I guess. Any place where you got limited area to operate in and out of, maybe rough fields, uh, the camera will show on our, our flying portions that the shock absorption capability is well, just nothing short of tremendous. And Bill says we didn't even use all of the shock absorption. We were talking about how much the shock absorbers work, and it looks like there's this huge motion here that could be 18 inches or something. In fact, in the bouncing, deliberate bouncing landings that we did, there's a tie wrap located right down here by my fingers, and here's the bottom of the shock. And despite the what seemed like a lot of impact, which I assumed the tire was taking up a lot, and I guess it did take up a lot. That motion here only deflected that shock absorber about, I don't know, a couple of inches is all that is. Now, while I'm up here, though, I want to show you the other great feature of this airplane, and that's these slats up here, which I'm going to move up. And you can see the center section move, but there are three sections of these. Here's another one out here. So each wing has got three sections of these movable slats, but the pilot doesn't do anything. The airplane knows what it wants to do, and the right amount of uh, the flaps, uh, the slats do not all move at the same time. It depends on exactly what's going on with air flowing over the wing. All right, let's put this all together for you now. We're going to go from nose to tail. First of all, an 84-inch. That's a big, great big prop on the front from Cato. Then the Continental slash Titan 180 horsepower engine. Then we've got a series of three independent flaps, uh, slats on the leading edge of the wing, which move independent of any action by the pilot. You don't have to do anything inside the cockpit. Now, as we go back on the wing, we get back to those double Fowler, Fowler slotted flaps that we saw with the VGs on them on the secondary uh, effect, and then back all the way to the tail again, which, which tail location has changed a little bit over time as well. Finally, then we come back up here to the great big tires the big shock absorbers, and the tail wheel is shock absorbed as well. I think that characterizes the shock options on the Outback Shock. As you might expect, when you, when you give 180 horsepower to an airplane like this with the tail and large surfaces back there, almost immediately the tail comes up, uh, just virtually as soon as you add power. And not very many seconds later, the main wheels leave the ground. But in flight, when we did stalls, 
the numbers would drop down to in the 28, 27, 26 range. This is miles an hour. It can slow down to that extent. And even then, in the stalls, the aircraft, it just kind of comes back to a mushing motion. There's no sudden action anyway, no drop of the wings, no drop of the nose. Even in accelerated stalls and even with a ridiculous deck angle really pointed up looking at the sky, the stall characteristics were utterly benign. And that's a function of these things all working together. Those slats on the leading edge of the wing, the double fowler slots on the aft end of the wing, and then when you come back in and land in those configurations, you begin to pull the landing gear into the picture. Now, this is not a fast airplane. We probably didn't, we probably never saw more than uh, about 80 miles an hour, but we were not trying to go fast because that's not really the point of this airplane. Trying to see its top speed would be anticlimactic. What this airplane really does is ground proximity flying very well. And, and that's what it just utterly excels at. We did a series of landings, and I'm saying a series of landings because it was all basically one landing where we just, we would come down, slap the airplane on the ground, literally slap it on the ground like you would not do in any other aircraft. And we did that repeatedly, four or five times down the runway, and then with just a few hundred feet left on the runway, which you, again, wouldn't do and shouldn't do in most other airplanes, full power to it, climbed up so fast that it's just, it's an amazing feeling to have that much power pulling you up. A downside of all that power is, of course, that she's a little noisy. This uh, Titan engine is not the quietest engine out here. Uh, so you got to consider for neighbor relations. So we didn't stay over there and do that too long. So the seats are comfortable. However, they don't adjust in flight. They can adjust, but they're ground adjustable, you might say. There are some uh, movement possibilities. It's not a wide range, but a little bit of movement to adjust to the pilot. But you're going to have to do that before you take off. You can see the wide door opening here, so it's pretty easy. Uh, the access to the cockpit is quite straightforward. But once you, when you're getting out, you move both legs out and then just lower yourself down to the ground. That way you just fall into your feet. That's pretty easy. One last thing, I mentioned the structure up here that you use to get in the airplane. They have deliberately designed the aircraft to remove, there's normally a cross brace in this style of airplane that might go right about here. But if you're operating in Alaska where there's some fairly rough conditions to do that in, pilots often wear a helmet. And if the helmet were in here, you'd be banging up against that tube and whatnot. So they have re-engineered this structure up here to leave all this area open so even a tall guy could wear a helmet in there without bumping his head. And by the way, as long as I'm looking up there, skylight all the way from the windshield all the way to the back, overhead, and wide openings on both sides without any struts in the way. So there's really good visibility. And in the front, it would be even better. But even from the back, very good visibility. That's not always common in this style of tandem airplane. Of course, when you're taxiing, the typical thing from the raft seat, you cannot see directly forward. You can't really see very far. You can a little better, but not well from the front either. So you have to do the fishtailing taxiing. However, on landing approach, because the airplane has all these features to it, you can have the nose considerably down on landing and you can see very well what's ahead of you for landing until you get actually to the moment of flare. But at that point, uh, you're well down on the runway. In addition, uh, if the camera can come over here a little bit, there are some clear panels here, so you can see my hand behind the panel here. Now, you don't really look down there, you don't see anything from down there, but it gives you a peripheral vision that you can notice things moving down there so that it would help from the pilot. One thing Bill didn't even know, when you sit in the aft seat and you're looking down, you can see both tires from the aft seat. He says you cannot do that from the front. You, your, your vision is blocked on the angle a little bit. So flying from the back, it would be no problem to land. You can see right when the wheels are going to touch down. So finally, while I'm mentioning the seats again, let me flip this one forward. You can see that it goes well forward up here. Then you have nice access to the uh, compartment back here, which is a sewn, pan a sewn fabric. Uh, container for goods that you put back there and that can zip up closed here as I'm doing right there. The aircraft has tanks in each wing, uh, which tanks have a, there's an indicator back here. I don't know if the uh, camera can see it, but there's a nice tubular indicator up there. One of those kind that shows you definitely, absolutely how much fuel there is in the wing, not just a gauge in the panel. I actually like those better. And uh, the aircraft holds 13 and a half on each side, so usable fuel, so that's 27 gallons of usable. Uh, the engine burns in the neighborhood, well, it depends on how much power you're using. You throttle it well back, it gets down to about four, but it, normally it's up higher than that, six, seven, eight gallons per hour. So you still got plenty of uh, fuel on there for a pretty long flight, not distance long, but endurance long. 
Okay, you can also open, uh, you can see over here, I got my hand outside the aircraft there. So this whole long window all the way back to here opens from the outside. This whole side here, all the way down from here opens up. And you can do that at uh, less than 70 miles an hour. You can have them both open if you want. And for the kind of flying that some of us like to do from the days of flying ultralights around, uh, that'd be real fun. Today was a little cool off, so we didn't do that. All right, so you're finally down on the ground now. You've gotten out of the air. Well, before you get out of the aircraft, you're going to do shutdown. Of course, throttle back. You see it's got dual throttles. I've got my hand on the aft throttle. Here's the front throttle. And then below that on the left side, there's something we don't see all the time on Rotax aircraft because they don't use mixture control. So when you're turning off a Rotax, you just turn off the ignition. You shut off the electrics to the engine and it shuts off. In the case of this Titan, uh, it uses a mixture control. That's what the big knob was and to shut down the engine. Uh, the mixture control is a vernier control that you can finally adjust or you push in on the button and pull back. You starve the engine of gasoline and it shuts off. Now, the uh, Outback Shock, this is the very first one in the USA. There's a limited number of them in Europe as well. This was just introduced at the German Aero Show in 2016. So this is a new model. The Outback has been around, the Savage has been around, and there's a good many of those flying. But the Outback Shock, as it's called in this country, is uh, this is the very first one you're looking at right here. We don't know, therefore, what kind of delivery times they are, but we'll give you a web address where you can go find that out. It's available only as a special light sport aircraft. There's not a kit option for this airplane. But it's sold through the Sport Air USA company, uh, operated and met by Bill Canino, who's been in the business for since the very beginning of light sport aircraft, and he's proven to be a reliable supplier. He operates out of North Little Rock, Arkansas, where he does all kinds of uh, um, maintenance work and avionics installations and other things there. It's a full service shop and in addition to the delivery of the airplane. So for more information than we've given you here and to find out about delivery and to find out about pricing, it's very attractively priced. I won't go into exact numbers, but it's dramatically less than other airplanes, aircraft that look similar to this particular one. And uh, you can find out lots more about that at uh, savage.aero. And I'll have information about all of the Sport Air aircraft, the many that they sell. They also sell the Sting and the Sirius and some other aircraft as well. You can find all about all of those on bydanjohnson.com. And thanks for coming along with us as we went to fly the brand new Outback Shock.